I'm Connie Hungerford, the interim president of the college, and I'm having a wonderful time this weekend, meeting many new people and greeting others that I've known for years. This weekend, as you know, is packed with activities. There's something for everyone, actually several <laughs> things for almost every hour, regardless of age or interest. But for me, and I'm sure for many of you, the annual McCabe lecture is a highlight. And this le year's lecture is especially important and relevant as indicated by the title on goodness and education. Our lecturer, Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot, class of 1966, will be formally introduced in a few minutes. First, as we do every year, I want to say a few words about this lecture itself. Thomas B. McCabe is a legendary figure at Swarthmore, the former chairman and CEO of Scott Paper Company. He held several important government offices, including chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System and public governor of the New York Stock Exchange. Thomas McCabe believed deeply in the value of education and was widely honored for his contributions to the field. During his lifetime, he received honorary doctoral degrees from 15 colleges and universities, including Swarthmore and the universities of Maryland and Delaware. President Harry Truman awarded him the Medal of Merit for his contributions to education, business, and government. Thomas McCabe graduated from Swarthmore in 1915 and his vision, foresight, and generosity shaped our college profoundly for much of the past century. Generations of Swarthmore students have studied, I would say lived, in the Thomas B. and Jeanette L. McCabe Library, and faculty have pursued their research there as well. The Scott Amphitheater, where new students, where new students share first collection, and graduating seniors so memorably celebrate last collection and commencement was his glorious gift. Thomas McCabe also established the McCabe Achievement Awards Scholarship Fund, which has awarded scholarships to more than 250 students. Over the years, we have come to know them as the McCabes. Many of them, both current students and alumni, are with us today. The McCabe Lecture, established in his honor and first delivered in 1986, reflects Thomas McCabe's commitment to education and his belief in young people's potential to make their marks on the world. It is given every year by an individual with a distinguished career in any of a wide range of fields. This year, it is education. It is customary for one of our current McCabe's to introduce our speaker, so I am very pleased to introduce you now to Abigail Lauder. Abigail is president of the McCabe Society. She's a senior working towards a double major in biology and economics. During her time at Swarthmore, she has studied animal behavior at the Max Planck Institute of Ornithology in Radzofeld, Germany and has researched the distribution of government health services to women in rural Rajasthan, India. Abigail is captain of the Swarthmore women's field hockey team and is an active member of the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. She also volunteers as a hospice assistant at Ascend Hospice. So let's welcome Abigail Lauder, who will introduce our speaker. In fact, she's hot off the field from a field hockey match. Good afternoon, and thank you all for attending this year's Thomas B. McCabe Memorial Lecture. In a few moments, we will hear Dr. Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot's lecture titled, On Goodness in Education, Disrupting the Discourse. First, I would like to take a moment to introduce our distinguished speaker. Dr. Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot graduated from Swarthmore College in 1966 with a Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology. In 1972, she received her doctorate in sociology of education at Harvard and has remained on the faculty since. 
She is the Emily Hargroves Fisher Professor of Education at Harvard University. Upon her retirement, this professorship will become the Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot Endowed Chair, making her the first African-American woman in Harvard's history to have an endowed professorship named in her honor. <laughs> The first endowed professorship in Dr. Lawrence Lightfoot's name was established in 1993 here at Swarthmore College. Educator, researcher, author, and public intellectual, Dr. Lawrence Lightfoot has written 10 books. Her most recent book, Exit, The Endings That Set Us Free, was published in 2012. Dr. Lawrence Lightfoot is a member of numerous professional and scholarly committees and boards of directors including the American Philosophical Society, the American Academy of Political and Social Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Education, Bright Horizons, WGBH Educational Foundation, the Berkeley College of Music, and the Atlantic Philanthropies, where she is deputy chair. She has been a fellow at the Bunting Institute at Radcliffe College and at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. In 1984, she was the recipient of the prestigious MacArthur Prize, and in 1993, she was awarded Harvard's George Ledley Prize, an award given for research that makes the most valuable contribution to science and the benefit of mankind. In 1995, she became a Spencer Senior Scholar and in 2008, she was named the Margaret Mead Fellow by the Academy of Political and Social Sciences. Dr. Lawrence Lightfoot has received 28 honorary degrees from colleges and universities in the United States and Canada. We are extremely fortunate to have her here with us today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot. Thank you. And it's great to be here. Thank you for coming through the sleet and the rain and the cold to join uh, us here for this event. Um, and thank you, of course, to Thomas McCade, class of 1915, for his generosity and his forward thinking as he gave so much for this institution and obviously supported um, those of you who are McCabe scholars. I remember the McCabe scholars. You know, they were the chosen people out there. Uh, carefully selected and special in so many ways uh, when, when I was here at Swarthmore. We live in perilous times where educators have a particular responsibility, times that demand our engagement, our courage, and our imaginations. It is, in fact, impossible for any of us to have a conversation that refers to child rearing or teaching and learning that speaks about the human condition without our minds being flooded by the bloody images that seem to be unleashed with great force when the planes hit the twin towers in lower New York City on September 11, 2001, a date now etched in all of our hearts. Perhaps it was the experience of the violence and tragedy on our own soil, touching people who could be our brothers and sisters, our neighbors and friends. Perhaps it was the unfamiliar experience of being the physical targets of foreign fire that awakened in us a new and an unwelcome awareness of the accumulating atrocities across our country and around our world. Since 9-11, we have seen the bloodshed up close, multiplied a hundredfold by the 24-7 media coverage and amplified by the vast web of social media. We are wracked by the carnage, by the murders of innocent mothers and children in Afghanistan, by the brutal bombings and attacks in Israeli, Israel and Palestine, and the volatile border conflicts between India and Pakistan by the genocide and raping of women and girls in the Sudan, by the oppression and massacre of hundreds of thousands of people in Tibet, 
by the uncovering of rampant pedophilia by priests and bishops of the Catholic Church, by the devastating flooding of the Gulf Coast and the obscenely inept response of federal, state, and local governments who for years ignored all warnings of danger, by the separations and suspicions of racial, cultural, and religious discrimination pitting newcomers against old-timers, refugees against established and entitled citizens, by the Wall Street crash following the unleashed greed, deceit, and corruption by whole hosts of corporate giants, underscoring the vast abyss between the privileged few at the top and the marginalized many at the bottom. And more recently, by the brutal beheadings of brave journalists and citizens at the hands of ISIS, by the abduction, rapes, and selling of young women and girls in northern Nigeria, by the open hunting season on unarmed black men, the murders of Trevon Martin and Michael Brown stand as a symbol of the terror all black mothers feel as our sons walk out the door on any ordinary afternoon. And closer still, and here at Swarthmore College, by the sexual assaults on college campuses, in the military, and off the National Football League field, where the institutional responses have been opaque and inadequate. The symbolism and reality of each of these assaults, taken individually and collectively, make us feel helpless, vulnerable, and victimized. Our tears express our deepest anguish, fears, confusion, and rage. Our democratic values and civil rights seem to be crumbling around us as we work to find our spiritual and moral anchors. In our adult confusion and impotence, we struggle with finding the right words to support and guide our children and our students. In our adult confusion and impotence, we struggle mightily. During these long years of acute anxiety about our fragile and troubled world, we educators, our society's public adults, have felt a particular challenge and responsibility to take care of the young people in our charge, to help them come to terms with these awful, cruel events and their aftermath, to find a precarious balance between mourning and moving on, between revenge and reconciliation, between grieving and getting busy. This afternoon, rather than being consumed by the darkness, I want to pivot towards the light, seeing what we might discover if we reframe our questions, readjust our lenses, and probe our preoccupations, and seeing how the refocusing of our lenses might change our perspective on the educational landscape. I want to center my analysis this afternoon on some of the reigning contemporary discourses in education, offering my voice as counterpoint to many of the prevailing themes that dominate public debates about schooling. Themes that I fear distort our ability to see, hear, and teach all of our children. Themes that tend to mask the hard-won progress that we have made and distort our ability to find meaningful and robust remedies to our chronic and critical problems. And themes that ultimately compromise our efforts to build a democratic nation. The subtitle of my talk, Disrupting the Discourse, refers then to my efforts to challenge much of the contemporary rhetoric, metaphors, and images that are threaded through our public dialogues about education and about schooling. At a time when educational cultures need to reflect a plurality of voices, stories, and cultural narratives, a variety of intelligences and identities, and a spirit of inquiry, criticism, and adventure, many educators and policymakers have retreated to a view of learning and achievement that is narrow and monolithic. How might we help to create school cultures from early childhood classrooms through graduate school training that forge the connections between excellence and equity, 
learning and justice, disciplined inquiry and truth-telling. I want to make three modest, ambitious, and intertwined suggestions, all beginning with V. V. The first has to do with reframing our view. The second centers on the need to lift up our voices. And the third expresses an imperative that everyone in our schools, every child, every student, feel seen and known, that everyone be visible. The three V's, view, voice, and visibility. I know you sophomore folks can keep three in mind. <laughs> so first V, reframing our view. Social scientists have a long legacy of focusing their investigations on pathology and disease rather than on health and resilience. And their stance has traditionally been one of studying down, investigating and probing the lives of people who are other, people who are poor and colored, people who are undereducated and marginalized. Sitting on their distant academic perch, these scholars of what one of my colleagues calls imperial social science often confuse difference with dysfunction and difference with disease. This intellectual habit is magnified in research on schooling, where investigators have been much more vigilant in documenting failure than they have been in describing examples of success. To some extent, this focus on pathology is understandable, maybe even laudable. If we can identify the roots of the disease, we may be able to find a cure. But I believe the relentless scrutiny of failure has many distorting results. First, we begin to get a view of our schools and, community and the communities they serve that magnifies what is wrong and neglects evidence of promise and potential. We create a narrative that describes an educational system in steady decline. Second, this focus on failure and pathology can often lead to, a, to despair, a nagging cynicism and inaction. Why should we pour our energy and resources into seeking to remedy problems that are resistant to change and improvement? And why should we continue to suffer our own feelings of inadequacy, our own narcissistic injuries, when our efforts seem to make little difference? If things are really that bad, and there is no hope for change, then why should we even try to do anything about them? Third, the documentation of pathology often bleeds into blaming the victim. It lands heavily on the shoulders of those who are most oppressed and disenfranchised, those who do not have access to the halls of power and decision making, those who have no voice or visibility in the public debates about their fate. I believe that those of us who are committed to improving schools then must of course admit the huge challenges we all face in making them pro productive and nurturing environments. We must shake our fists and raise our voices in opposition to the pervasive inequalities and injustices. Our resistance and our rage shows we care. And we must translate our outrage into sustained commitment strategic action, and determined advocacy. But we must also search out the goodness in educational settings. If we begin by asking the question, what is good here? What is working well? What is strong? What is worthy? We will discover a different reality. We may even uncover a lever for change, a spark of promise, that has been formally obscured by our well-worn negative prophecies. By goodness, I do not mean that we should romanticize or idealize the work of educators or mask their flaws and imperfections, or that we should ignore the powerful systemic and structural forces that impede productive educational reform. Rather, we need to use a lens that is both generous and discerning, both tough and forgiving. We must develop a way of seeing the inevitable two-ness of life, 
the beautiful, ugly, nasty, nice ambiguities, the resilience amidst the suffering, the agency that resists victimization. We must adopt a perspective that admits the inevitable weaknesses and vulnerabilities embedded in any good enterprise. And when we find goodness in all of its fullness, in all of its complexity, we must invent ways of documenting it so that the principles and lessons of goodness might be reinterpreted and embedded in other places. I remember the impulse I had, it was actually more than an impulse, it was an intentional, strong imperative. More than 30 years ago, when I designed a piece of research with the intention of helping to change the tone and tenor of the conversation about our nation's high schools, a conversation that had grown cynical and complaining, narrow and judgmental, a conversation that felt self-defeating in its fatalism. In April of 1983, a Nation at Risk, a report from the National Commission on Excellence in Education, was published with great fanfare and clamorous uproar. The report's soundbite conclusions quickly became absorbed and imprinted on a public looking to blame schools for what they saw as their chronic failures in educating and in socializing our young. There were certainly a lot of things cited in the report that deserved critique and scrutiny. The alarming proportion of students across our country who were graduating from high school illiterate. The rampant problems of authority and discipline in schools. The lack of coherence and rigor in the curriculum. And the widening gap of resources, opportunity, and achievement between rich and poor communities. But the report piled on in a way that was blanket and dismissive. Claiming to offer an objective, measured appraisal of public schooling in America, the nation at risk was on close inspection, actually filled with accusation and vitriol, insisting that schools were solely at fault for the state of our deteriorating society, and saddling schools with the solo responsibility for rebuilding a healthy, wholesome democracy. But more troubling than the vitriol was the nostalgia that reeked through pages of the document. A nostalgia that idealized the, the American past and rendered the contemporary scene grotesque by contrast. Looking through rose-colored glasses, the nation at risk painted a picture of a time in our history when families were stable and children were good when children were respectful, when teachers were devoted and communities revered them. It was a view of our past shattered by a history of amnesia, a distortion of an American past that was actually ne has never been stable or peaceful, a history that has always been chronically fragmented and changing, a history in which each generation laments the deteriorating values and irresponsible behaviors of the next one. Against this backdrop of accusation and disappointment and the always persistent social scientific preoccupation with pathology, in my book, The Good High School, I hope to offer a counterpoint and challenge to the monotone of negativism. For three years, I traveled across this country documenting the character and the culture of six high schools, two urban schools in poor communities, two affluent suburban schools, and two elite preparatory academies. And then, in this sense, I was studying up, not down. In all of these schools, they were expressing goodness in very different ways. Seeking to, and I was seeking to understand the sources of their stability and resilience, the arc of their institutional growth, and hoping to uncover the threats of inertia and resistance that compromise their brave efforts. In searching for the good, I was eager to hear the voices and insights, the perspectives and experiences of the school's inhabitants, not only the distant appraisals of researchers or experts, 
And I wanted to produce a document that was informative and inspiring to educators, a portrayal of their lives and of their work with which they could feel identified, challenged, and implicated. My own methodological invention of portraiture, a bridging of empiricism and aesthetics, has been a pur purposeful, often lonely, effort to document goodness and to spread the good news. It has been a quest for something missing from a good deal of scholarship in the social sciences that is steeped so much in positivist impulses and protocols. A quest blending science and art, expressivity and restraint, a quest full of li listening and witness, listening to the sound of, of a human voice making sense of other human voices, especially those not often heard, voices of women, poor people, folks of color, tracing the line of the story set in historical context, placing the actors in a long-running moral and political drama, producing a text that reveals the eclecticism of method and material, a narrative that reaches out to a broad and diverse audience in language that is accessible and evocative, that seeks to inform, inspire, and provoke thought and action, that speaks to the heart and the head, and in the end, hoping to build a broader community of participants who might become more fully engaged in efforts to improve the educational project. My second V, lifting up our voices. This more generous and forgiving vision, this probing for goodness, is related to my second theme, which challenges the tone, dynamics, and language of the public discourse about education. Too much of the conversation about schools is reductionistic and rhetorical, driven by ideology rather than insight, and pitched to advantage particular constituencies of powerful adults rather than for the benefit of all children. It is an unruly discourse resonating with the voices of researchers and policymakers whose perspectives are often distant from the realities of life in schools. The voices of policy folks tend to be combative and expedient while the voices of researchers too often seem opaque and remote. I am urging the development and amplification of voices that bridge the great divide between theory and practice, that take advantage of the different perspectives of researchers and practitioners, that recognize the richness of the counterpoint that gets produced when disciplined inquiry is grounded in and shaped by the social and historical context. This means, of course, that we need to, to, to dismantle the hierarchy between the thinkers and the doers, the intellectuals and the activists, and create a symmetry of voices that values each perspective. We must listen, for example, to the intimate knowledge of teachers, knowledge that grows out of subjectivity, intuition, direct experience, and deep reflection. A knowledge that is forged out of autobiographical roots, developmental history, and personal perspective. A knowledge that is often best captured in images, metaphors, and vivid storytelling. And let us not forget the wise, authoritative, and critical voices of students so often silenced from the discourse, so attentive to the adult hypocrisies and contradictions, so ready to teach us about the beat of contemporary culture. At the same time, we must honor the intelligence and insights of researchers whose stance must be vigilantly counterintuitive, skeptical, and enough distant from the action to be able to see patterns and trends. We must be ready to reckon with the researcher's evidence that surprises us, challenging our long-held presumptions and prejudices. 
I believe that the public debates around education will only be fully productive when we listen for and honor all of these voices and when by creating this great cacophony we begin to speak to larger, more eclectic audiences rather than a public dialogue informed by expediency and ideology, we will be able to develop a language that is understandable, not exclusive or esoteric, a language that encourages people to join in the conversation, provokes debate, invites reflection and action. Joseph Featherstone, one of my favorite social historians, traces the connection between intimate storytelling of practitioners and the public discourse we hope to impact and draws the continuum between analysis and solidarity. What he calls a people scholarship is rooted in explicitly humanistic values, honors the intertwined truths of analysis and solidarity, and can, he claims, be traced back to the great works of William James and W.E.B. Du Bois. It is a scholarship that embraces both analytic rigor, that is a perspective that is discerning and distant, and community building. These are acts of intimacy and connection. In Souls of Black Folk, for example, W.E.B. Du Bois was at work on the problem of human blindness, linking the public existence of the Negro to the inner world behind the veil and offering a new kind of scholarship in which scientific facts gathered in the field would give voice to a people's existence. He was the quintessential boundary crosser. Everything was grist for Du Bois's mill, from autobiography to history, from politics to journalism to psychology, from fiction to poetry to spirituality in constructing a rich text of objectivity and advocacy. Du Bois unmasked and interrogated the negative white images of the lives of black folk. This slender and powerful volume, Du Bois is best known, became a kind of scholarly poem, a, a dawning and opening for blacks, a potential vantage point for envisioning a different American culture. And interestingly and unforgettably, an autobiography, Du Bois is sketching himself as a teacher in a rural black school. So I hope that we in our scholarship and in our activism will disrupt the discourse and reframe the conversation, that we will resist the hierarchies of power and language that get in the way of authentic and inclusive representations of a humanistic education and that we will challenge the disciplinary boundaries and theoretical grids that inhibit our tackling of the naughty, naughty, not naughty, naughty, <laughs> nuanced questions that resist easy measurement. I have to say that sentence again, it's a great sentence. <laughs> and I got it a little bit tangled. And that we will challenge the disciplinary boundaries and theoretical grids that inhabit our there I got it, inhibit our tackling of the naughty, nuanced questions that resist easy measurement, easier to write than to say. <laughs> I hope that our public and private discourses will embrace the dialectic between analysis and solidarity and create the moral and social spaces for our imaginations to soar. The third and last V making everybody visible. A real solidarity rooted in intimacy and connection grows out of authentic inclusivity, not clannishness. My third theme expresses my belief that diversity, variety, and contrast are central ingredients of educational goodness. Education must not be a monolithic experience. It must honor the differences in culture, race, ethnicity, and sexual orientation, even as it searches always for universal values. Students and teachers from preschool through college and graduate training 
should be challenged to consider alternative ways of being, different ways of thinking, and contrasting value systems. This, of course, means more than counting bodies. The numbers of blacks, Latinos, Native Americans, and Asians on the faculty or in the student body. A body count that no longer makes sense when so many of the bodies refuse to accept the social constructs that do not represent them or mirror their identities. It means more than scheduling rituals and celebrations in honor of high holy days or revered cultured hero, cultural heroes. And it means more than making sure that every cultural or religious group gets visibly reflected in the curriculum. The real challenges of diversity are subtle and complex. Their very subtlety is menacing. This, these challenges reside in the substance and texture of discourse, in the feelings of engagement embedded in teaching and learning, in seeking to create an environment in which no one will have to endure the distortions of tokenism or feel responsible for representing a monolithic group, where people will feel safe in expressing opposing views and will learn to risk discomfort and vulnerability on the ways to genuine understanding. The enactment of diversity is tremendously important as our country grows increasingly multi multicultural and as our world becomes smaller and smaller. When boundaries are erased and home is not geographically circumscribed. But instead of embracing the rich variation around us, I see a rising tendency towards clannishness and us against them mentality, a ridiculously unfair combat between the 99% and the 1%. I see a retreat from the social commitments we fought so hard for in the last few decades that troubles and even enrages me. I see it in city schools where middle class abandonment and white flight have left schools poor and colored. I see it in the mask messages and subtext behind, hiding behind our policy discourses about achievement gaps, accountability and regulation, and races to the top. I see it in the wasteful wars between charter school advocates and public school defenders. I see it in the policy makers who use the verbiage of no child left behind to defend a competitive regime that punishes children who attend schools in under-resourced and marginalized communities. I see it in the residential segregation and the gated communities that symbolize exclusion and hierarchy, in the immigrant wars and the literal and symbolic walls that we erect between outsiders and insiders. I see it in the dismantling of affirmative action programs in colleges and universities and a Supreme Court willing to reconsider their legitimacy. I see it in who gets trapped on the other side of the digital divide. In this climate of prejudice and exclusivity, we who claim to welcome diversity will have to fight for this worldview in the educational institutions we attend, in the communities we inhabit, and in the places where we work. We will have to argue that pluralism brings a richness, a colorfulness, and a vitality that closed communities can never know. We will have to convince others that places that exclude are impoverished places that limit the full range of learning and growth. And we will need to enact these practices of inclusion as early as possible in the classrooms of the youngest children. Amen. <laughs> Diversity and authentic inclusivity, I believe, are primarily about visibility. Visibility is not about overexposure not about being identified as the exception, not about standing apart or standing above, not about representing the race. Rather, visibility is about everyone feeling seen, everyone feeling acknowledged, and everyone being seen as worthy. 
I will never forget one morning when my now 33-year-old daughter, Tolani, was about four. She woke up singing her version of Stevie Wonder's soulful anthem, You Are So Beautiful to Me. Transposing the words and refocusing the light, Tolani crooned her sweet little girl rendition. I am so beautiful to you. <laughs> she sang as she spread her arms wide and embraced the world around her. Yes, Talani, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and those eyes are more likely to see beauty if they belong to a person who herself feels beautiful. To see and feel beauty, we must be visible. Visibility, of course, is the opposite of invisibility. In the always painful opening paragraphs of Ralph, Ralph Ellison's classic book, Invisible Man, published more than a half century ago, the protagonist's words resonate with the emptiness and humiliation of being unnoticed and unseen. I quote from his opening paragraphs. I am an invisible man. No, I am not a spook like those who haunted Edgar Allan Poe, nor am I one of your Hollywood ectoplasms. I am a man of substance, of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids, and I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. Like the bodiless heads you see sometimes in circus sideshows, it is as though I have been surrounded by mirrors of hard, distorted glass. When they approach me, they see only my surroundings, themselves, or figments of their imagination. Indeed, everything and anything except me. End quote. The plight of Ellison's invisible man echoes in our lives today. Our images continue to be distorted by what Ellison describes as the construction of their inner eyes. The prejudice of invisibility still lingers on. But as access and opportunity increase for people of color, as we have a slightly larger but still insufficient presence in the institutions of higher education, learning and the worlds of work, we also face an equally pernicious invisibility, one that we may be guilty of imposing on ourselves. In our attempts to fit in, in our ambition to make it, we sometimes try too hard not to stand out, not to make waves not to be different. We resist disturbing the discourse. We forget to whom we must be held accountable. We lose touch with our roots and forget about our responsibility to face toward home. And in the process, we risk transforming ourselves into empty reflections without voice or soul. To be visible, we must live lives of vigilant observation. Criticism, criticism and action. To be seen, we must see. Observation and criticism must become daily habits of our lives as educators. As we test the moral threads of our society, as we rage against the powerlessness, violence, and oppression in Chester, Pennsylvania, in Ferguson, Missouri, in New Orleans, in Los Angeles, in Gaza, in the Ukraine, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in the Sudan, in Syria, in Nigeria, in North Korea. As we support fairness, justice, and peace everywhere, goodness in education means learning to risk visibility. It, learn, it means learning to bear public witness. My words this afternoon, on purpose, sound serious and weighty. As I urge you to complicate and broaden 
your view of educational goodness as I urge us to honor and acknowledge the perspective and voices of researchers and advocates, teachers and children, and develop a broader, more inclusive conversation. As I urge us to see diversity as a strength and work towards its realization in the institutions and communities we inhabit. As I urge us to make ourselves and others visible, bearing witness and speaking out. To some extent, these are all countercultural admonitions ways of being and seeing that will be difficult to sustain in a society filled with conflicting tendencies. They will require disturbing the discourse and reframing the conversation. There will be conflict, dissent, and struggle as we go forth and get busy. Confronting the institutional structures that inhibit access, challenging the stereotypes and discrimination that render too many people voiceless and invisible, scrutinizing the cultural priorities and that reinforce fierce competition and the harsh paradigm between winning and losing, and exposing the historical narrative that haunt our contemporary efforts to build a democratic nation. So this is big work. This is intellectually discerning work. This is ethical and relational work. This is passionate, soulful work. And this is work that we must do together, collectively and in community, with optimism, with hope, with respect, with reverence, with struggle and intentionality, with grit and with grace. On this day, after the high holy day of Halloween, when the ghosts from our past hover around us, I feel the haunts of the loneliness, both the hypervisibility and the invisibility that I often experienced at Swarthmore as one of five African American students on campus when I arrived in 1962. An isolation and an overexposure that still echoes through me as I walk across this beautiful campus 48 years later. And I can't help recalling an even more ancient memory, a beautiful, ugly story from my youth. It was Negro History Week, and Mr. Miller, my earnest teacher, was doing his best to honor the heritage of the one Negro child in his class by having us all read the work of, as he put it, one colored poet. This was fifth grade. The poet's name was Jean Toomer. I vividly recall the quiet stares of my classmates watching how I responded to being singled out. But my deeper recollection a surprising and welcome, unintended consequence was that we, as we recited Toomer's verse, I learned for the first time the power and the meaning of metaphor. Here is Toomer's poem. The Mississippi sister of the Ganges, main artery of earth in the Western world is waiting to become, in the spirit of America, a sacred river. Whoever lifts the Mississippi lifts himself and all of America. Whoever lifts himself makes the great brown river smile. As I returned to Swarthmore College, a place so resonant with my long ago strivings to be seen, with my stuttering efforts to find voice and speak my mind, I want us to celebrate the struggle. I want us to honor the dissonance and welcome the disruptions. I want us to listen for the metaphors and not miss the unintended consequences but mostly I want to urge us to get busy. 
Together, let's make the great brown river smile. Thank you very much.